haven't been around in a few years because I've been in college. So my name is Carly Wolford, and um, I am the daughter of Chris and Lisa Wolford, sister to Cameron and Blair Wolford. I've been a part of this church since I was born. Um, so a lot of you know my heart and just how the Lord has been calling me to missions. And so um, it's been really cool to see just how he's been preparing me through school and just through different ministry opportunities. And so right now I'm attending North Greenville University in Greenville, South Carolina, where I'm getting a degree in intercultural studies, which is in the College of Christian Studies. Um, so I'm taking theology classes, um, different cultural classes, evangelism, mission, stuff like that. It's just, it's a dream. It's literally so fun. I love it. Just learning more about the Bible um, and how to interpret it and read it. So, yeah, so school kind of led me to Provo, which you're going to hear about in just a minute. So that's kind of what I'm here for. But before I start, I wanted to pray really fast. So bow your heads. Okay. <laughs> Dear God, I thank you so much for this day and this, just for this sweet opportunity to get to share about what you did through us uh, in Utah for the month of May. Um, I just thank you for the opportunity that we get to be a part of your work because, Lord, we know that you don't need us, but um, we get to be a part of sharing the gospel with people. And I pray that um, at the end of this that people would feel burdened for, um, for Utah, but also just for our community um, and just feel urgency to want to share the gospel with those around us. And we love you, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here's an outline. I am very visual and very much of a planner, so uh, here's what we're doing. Um, we're going to talk about why, why I was in Utah. A little bit about Mormonism, because I think that's really important. I personally thought that if you were a Mormon, it was honestly a different denomination than like of Christ Christianity. I just didn't know. Um, I knew a couple people growing up who were Mormon, and I didn't know what it meant. So we're going to talk about what that is and how drastically different it is. And it's not Christianity. Um, it's a false gospel. So um, we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about the North American Mission Board church plant that we worked alongside of in Provo, Utah. Um, what we did there, some cool gospel-centered stories, what God taught me personally, and then how you can pray. So, why we were in Utah. So, I guess, logically, we were there for school. Um, so, part of the intercultural studies degree, we spend um, our... Second semester of our junior year, we spend that whole semester learning about a different culture, um, just their religion and everything about it, and then we will spend a month there. And they've been, they sent students to Romania and Russia, and most commonly they send them to Ecuador, and that's actually where we were supposed to go, um, to actually the same tribe that Jim and Elizabeth Elliot were in, um, which I really wanted to go to, but we ended up going to Utah, and I didn't know why, but we're going to talk about why. So we did... Um, we spent our whole semester this past spring learning about the state of Utah, just um, how they became a state. Actually, the Mormons have a lot to do with that. They were denied statehood um, by the president at that time because of the Mormons. They're pretty persecuted people, which actually makes them think that they are, um, they are, they have the true gospel. Um, so we learned about the state of Utah. We learned about just the culture and Mormons, and then we learned about their theology, so we could learn more about what they believe to better share the true gospel with them. Um, so that's why we did it through our school, but Utah as a state is really lost. Um, so I have some percentages here real quick. Um, when I say LDS, that's referring to Latter-day Saint. So the president right now um, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the prophet, President Nelson, uh, he's making a big push for us, or anyone, for themselves too, to refer to themselves as LDS and not Mormon, because really it's deceiving, and he is trying to get away from all these negative connotations that come with Mormonism that you think of. Um, so he wants them to be referred to as LDS, so we call them that to respect them and to, to show that we cared enough to um, just care and call them by what they wanted to be called. Um, so, in Salt Lake County, which would encompass Salt Lake City and some of the neighboring cities, you got about 46% LDS. Um, in Utah County, which is where we were, which is Provo City in um, Orem, which is about 45 minutes away from Salt Lake City, it's 80% LDS. 
statewide, it's 60%. Um, and so then again, in Provo, exactly where we were, it's about 75 to 85% um, Latter-day Saint. And it's 17% non-religious affiliated. And then you've got 0.5% that are evangelical Christian. So that would bring us to about, um, in the area that we people there, um, BYU, Brigham Young University, I'm sure you guys have heard of it. It's a private um, Mormon college. 98% of the students that attend there are LDS, and they have 35,000 students. Um, Utah Valley University, which is the other really big college in that area in Orem, which Provo and Orem, it's basically like a Maribel Alcoa relationship. They're super close together. Um, they, they're 99.85% LDS, and they have 40,000 students, so literally 75,000 students just in this city, and that brings us to 99.85% lost. Um, and then, and here you kind of see, this was actually really eye-opening to me, that you can obviously see the really dark red is going to be Utah, but it really affects the whole entire western side of the U.S. And I wondered when I started learning about this, I was like, how did I not like, know about Mormonism before? How did I not understand how prevalent it is? And it's because it's just not over here. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it's not real and it's not a real problem. And I am sure a lot of you still know people that you've encountered that um, are Mormon, and so, yeah, it's a big deal. Um, missionaries, this is really huge. So prior to COVID, there were almost 60,000 LDS missionaries being sent out um, each year around the world. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has currently, 60, and this is from their website, 67,000 full-time young missionaries, um, again, all over the world. That can be in the States, it can be in Australia. Um, and the 67,000, that isn't even counting the students, the young 18-year-olds that do their two-year mission. So for those of you who don't know, when they turn 18, um, they are to go, um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints places them somewhere. This can be, you know, they're placed, I met a girl in Utah who, who just got her placement. It's a really big deal, and she got placed in Knoxville. So you, you might meet her. Um, and... So yeah, and you've got people in Chile getting placed in Salt Lake City. I met people from overseas and they're, it's just, it's crazy. Um, but when you factor in all the 18 year olds that are doing that, you, the number is about 100,000 each year on the field. Um, and the International Mission Board has 4,000 mission, current missionaries right now. And if we don't include Southern Baptists and we just include Baptists as a whole, we have roughly 12,000 missionaries out each year. So you have about 100,000 people sharing a false gospel every year around the world. Um, and so that should really burden our hearts. And I don't know if you can like see these numbers, but I just thought it was pretty eye-opening to see it's not just in Utah, it's everywhere. You've got six million in the US, a million in Mexico, 805,000 in the Philippines, um, 115,000 in New Zealand. So, and that's just, whether it's a big population and that's not, it's not like the biggest number in the grand scheme of things, that's still 115,000 lost people who think that maybe they have a true relationship with God, but they don't. Um, so it's really important. So now you have all these numbers and percentages, but it's like, okay, what is Mormonism? Why is it a big deal? So now we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And it's really hard to even try to explain all of it. I'm gonna have to just kind of glimpse over some things. Um, when, I first, when I first made this the other day, and I did a test trial this morning. I was at like an hour and a half long, and so I was like, I gotta cut some things out. Uh, so we're not gonna go through the whole entire history of how Mormonism came to be, but I do wanna address some really significant um, doctrinal differences that you should see, okay, shoot, like they are really lost. They, I mean, this is a false gospel. So starting off, they believe that the Bible is translated incorrectly. So they have four standard works that they kind of go by, which is the Bible, the King James Version specifically. So when, actually when we were doing, I didn't start off like this. The first two weeks I was there when we ended up like um, being able to have a gospel conversation and I opened my Bible, they weren't really hearing me because my Bible is not King James Version. And so later I found out Actually, Zad Tomberland, I was talking to him, he kind of gave me the advice. He was like, meet them, meet them where they're at with the King James Version. Um, so they listened to you, and so that's what we started doing. But that's, they um, they'll only listen to the King James Version of the Bible, and that's how they justify themselves as Christians. 
And then they have the Book of Mormon, which trumps the Bible. They would say it helps them interpret the Bible. And then they have the Pearl of Great Price and Doctrine and Covenants. And the Pearl of Great Price and Doctrine and Covenants are ever-changing. They believe in modern revelation from the prophet. So it's just, it's a ton of different things. Uh, you'll see some of them quoted in here. but So they believe the Bible is translated incorrectly. I'll read this. Um, so, so first, the prophet is the only man who speaks for the Lord in everything. Second, the living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works, including the Bible. And third, the living prophet is more important to us than a dead prophet. Um, and that comes from Ezra Taft Benson, who's a member of the Core of the Twelve Apostles. So, and we're going to hear about in a minute or later on how significant this prophet is. I mean, even their songs, they have their own um, LDS hymnal. And whether they're talking about the prophet Joseph Smith or their current prophet, it doesn't matter. Like, they, they worship their prophet um, because they think that he is in just direct communication with God. Like, he's given them all the, all the things. Um, but we also know that scripture says very differently. Second Peter tells us that we also have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention, uh, pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Um, Matthew 24, 35 says, And Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. John 8 says, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And lastly, Jeremiah, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Um, and Isaiah, my word shall not return to me empty, which that's actually a, a huge thing that we use a lot. We wanted to make sure that, and you'll hear about this, um, that we were opening the word in our conversations with people because at the end of the day, like the word of God doesn't return void. Um, and so, and we, it's crazy how foundational this is because we found very quickly that if you don't believe in the authority of the scriptures, it, it influences everything that you believe. Um, so that was really big. The next thing, they believe that the Mormon church is the only true church. So this quote by Joseph Smith, I, I was answered that I must join none of them. And he claims that he was told that by God and Jesus when they came down to him. Um, for they were all wrong. And the personage Jesus who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his spirit, that those professors were all corrupt. Um, and so... Joseph Smith believes that they appeared to him and told him not to join any of the churches. Um, and this was in the 1800s, um, and that they were going to give him the true gospel, and he was to, to start the one true church. And so those who believe this, the Latter-day Saints who believe this, they are so eager to share that with everybody, even though you'll hear them claim that they think that we believe the same thing, um, that we're all Christians. They know that they are part of the one true church, and they... They know that what we believe is different, and they, that's why they all go out on mission, because they, they want to share it. Um, the Bible, again, says otherwise. Romans 12 says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. So, again, the church consists of the body of believers. That's what we see in Scripture. Ephesians 4 says, well, I'm not going to read that one. We're, we're going to go to the next one. Um... Then they teach about a plurality of gods. Um, they don't accept, they don't believe in the Trinity. Or what they believe about the Trinity is that you've got three, three gods, um, not what we believe. And they also believe that man can work his way to godhood. So they, I could go into it, but they believe that Jesus um, and Satan were spirit brothers. And they, you know, we took some classes while we were there among other Latter-day Saints. And when asked the question, which is a wrong question in itself, but who is Jesus to you? They all would answer, of like the four people in the class that raised their hand and answered, they said, he's my friend. He's like my brother. And not like one of them said that like, he's my savior. And it's because they think that he's their friend and that they can be just like him because he was an ordinary man who happened to live a perfect life and they can do the same thing. And that's why you're going to see in a second their religion is so works-based and it's just works, works, works um, because that's how Jesus did it. What? <laughs> so Doctrine and Covenant says... Um, then they shall be gods because they have no end. Then shall they be above all because all things are subject unto them. Then shall they be gods and the angels are subject unto them. 
Doctrine and Covenants 132 says, they have entered into their exaltation according to the promises and sit upon thrones and are not angels, but are gods. Joseph Smith says, I have always declared God to be a distinct personage. Jesus Christ, a separate and distinct personage or spirit, and these three constitute three distinct personages and three gods. So, very quick, quickly, you can see that they believe in a polytheistic religion where we believe in a monotheistic religion. We believe in one God, um, and the Bible supports that. So we believe there is one God, and God is not a man. Um, Isaiah 43, before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Isaiah 44, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Hosea 11.9, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Ezekiel 28, because your heart is proud and you have said, I am a God, sit in the seat of the gods in the heart of the seas. Yet you are but a man and no God, so you make your heart like the heart of a God. Um, and really you can just see how this religion is from the devil. I mean, it really is. These these people, they desire to be like God. That's exactly what we saw in the garden. That's exactly Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. And so if we really look at it in that perspective, it's like this is it's, 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 so, it's so wrong. But at the end of the day, it's deception. And also we have to remember, too, only by the grace of God has he brought us to know him. So we have to remember that, too. We had to remember that as we communicated truth and love to them, um, because it's God is God is of salvation. He's the one that's going to bring that. Um, and the last thing, eternal life requires grace plus works. So, um, my personal favorite verse that they have is Second Nephi twenty five twenty three. We know that it is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> I kind of laughed when I first saw, it, but it's really it really is really sad um, because. You can never do enough with that. Like, you can always be doing more. Um, and so with that, they have absolutely no assurance of salvation whatsoever. Um, so, and even you see this, I mean, Lorenzo Snow is a really famous prophet, and he says the true gospel requires works. Um, the Bible, I mean, 2 Nephi 25, 23 is in direct uh, opposition. <laughs> it contradicts <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8. Uh, it says, for by grace ye have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Um, Galatians 2, 21 is great. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Um, and again, it's like you read this, and you're like, how would they not see this? Well, they don't believe in the authority of the scriptures, and they're deceived. They're deceived. Um, so, next. Oh, no. Okay. So now I'm going to, so I gave you kind of like a brief overview. There's so many th more things we could talk about, but for now, that's that. But you should be able to see that um, it's really sad what they believe. Um, so we, while we were, so we, my friend Abby and I, we are the ones who went to Provo. I didn't say that. She is in, um, she, we go to college together. We're in the same, same degree. We're the only two intercultural studies major in our, majors in our class. There's only probably eight of us in our whole university. So that tells you, I mean, not everyone who wants to do missions has to be majoring in missions by any means, but we're the only ones. Um, so the two of us lived in an Airbnb in Provo, and um, we worked with the North American Mission Board Church plant. And so I took this from their website, um, but they said that Mosaic Church was formed in October of 2020 when a few families, along with a team of young professionals, came together with the desire to see the biblical Jesus made not ignorable in the city of Provo, since then, the Lord in his grace has worked mightily through this community of believers to see joyful, passionate disciples of Jesus Christ boldly live for the sake of the gospel in Provo. And then with less than 0.5% of Provo professing faith in the biblical Jesus, they intentionally planted Mosaic Church in the heart of its downtown to see the power of the gospel transform the most unchurched city in North America. So I can't even begin to explain my gratitude for Mosaic Church. Um, we had two, they have four, four elders, or four pastors, um, but two of them, uh, Ben Neiser and David Gaskins, they really discipled Abby and I while we were there. They, they intentionally met with us twice a week, walked us through a book called Evangelism as Exiles, would recommend it to anybody. 
the book is actually written for, um, it's written in the context of living in a um, Islamic or Muslim country. Um, but it, every aspect of it applied the way we were at because we were in a cross-cultural setting. Um, but yeah, they, they poured into us. We, they encouraged us so much. Um, I just wish we had more time with them, honestly, to just learn from them. Our time was really short. We were only there for four weeks. Um, but yeah, it's incredible. They have about, so this is not a church building. They hold this, um, their service every Sunday in downtown in this place called Southworth Hall. It's kind of like a wedding venue. Um, that's where we hold it. We have about 50 people uh, each Sunday, which is actually really big, honestly. <laughs> There's three, there's two other churches um, in Provo, but two other Christian churches, but it's kind of lax. Like they're kind of going towards a more progressive theology. So it's kind of, there are two other Christian churches, but, um, and the biggest one, the, um, the one that has the most members, they have like 120 maybe. So like it's just, there's not a lot of people, but um, yeah, God. God is doing a lot um, at Mosaic Church and bringing lots of new people and lots of students from BYU. It's just been really cool. So that's about the church partnership. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what we did. Um, that's my friend Abby, who uh, I was with. So basically, we literally had like we didn't have work to do while we were there. We didn't have classes to take. Our only job that they gave us was we want you to go out and make a, a form relationships and hopefully have opportunities to share the gospel with people and invite them to Mosaic Church. Um, that, was our, that was our whole job. So it was pretty vague at the beginning, pretty broad. Um, and so essentially that just meant for us, we're just going to be super intentional everywhere we go. Like, just like we could do here, which we never really had done. But we're, since we're in Utah to be on mission and whatever, we're going to just be intentional at the coffee shop, at the bookstore, at the boutique, on the streets, whatever it is, um, we're going to be intentional to just see people. Um, we did get to go to some classes. So in Utah, they have these things called institute classes. And it's basically like free, a free Mormon version of, wait, if, yeah, a free Mormon version of seminary. So it's pretty, it's required for most students. It's open to the public, so they say. But we went to a few classes, and they literally bashed Christianity. And it was honestly the hardest thing to sit through, like talk about anger. I mean, you're sitting there listening to straight heresy and among 35 other returned missionaries who are my age. Um, and it's, I mean, it's really hard to be a part of, but it was also really good in a lot of ways to get to, to, get to see what they're learning um, and get to kind of just, you also learn or you also gain some respect from them for showing up when we didn't, we didn't by any means come in making sure they knew that we weren't. We actually kind of had to stay pretty low key because of some things that had happened in the past with visitors coming, which, so I kind of felt like I was undercover. Um, <laughs> but until, until a professor one day asked uh, just straight up if I, was, if I was LDS and I was like, no, and it was so scary, but that's another story. But um, so yeah, we got to, to hear, um, and the, the classes were taught by elders, um, which elders, so your missionaries that you have, um, they're called sisters, and then the others. So elder doesn't doesn't mean age or anything like that. I mean, an 18 year old boy is considered an elder. So, but in this case, they were older. Okay, so that's kind of what we did. And these are all these pictures are friends that we made, just people that we met and formed um, friendships with. So, oh, and we spent a lot of time in the Word like that. I've never been in a circumstance um, until. Utah, where I had to depend on scripture for strength, like every day. I had to, I had to, I just in prayer and just just diving into the word, especially when we were, when you're having conversations and you're having doctrinal disagreements, like our basis, our foundation for that is scripture. And so I need to know in scripture where I'm finding things and how to back that up. So I kind of included this picture because I ended up making a little um, kind of like a table of contents, but kind of color coded, including some um, common topics that we ended up talking about: the sufficiency of Jesus, the deity of Jesus, um, the, how there's one God, grace versus works, and just put them on tons of different pages and like labeled what verse. And that ended up being really helpful for me. If I ended up just having like a spur of the moment, co moment conversation, had my Bible on me, didn't know off the top of my head because I'm not the best at scripture memory trying to get better 
I would love to memorize all these. Um, but for now, it was really good to be able to go there and have that as a, a source. But yeah, we spent a ton of time in the Word. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. So our first story. Um, so our first week there, actually our first day, we were in Temple Square, which is in Salt Lake City, and we were talking to a sister um, missionary. Her name was Sister Sher. Really, really sweet. Just talking to her, asking her some questions. Never want to act like we know more than what she believes just because we've studied it. She lives it. So we would honestly act kind of like oblivious. Oh, like, what do you believe about this? And oh, you believe Jesus is a, like only a man? You know, just let her talk. Um, we, we formed a cool relationship with her. We ended up getting her number and we tried reaching out to her. She didn't really talk to us for like a week. And then she randomly texted and was like, hey, I have something that I think you guys would be really interested in. And then she, we asked what it was and she was like, the prophet's coming to Utah. And we were like, At what, what part of that would we be interested in? <laughs> But, um, and at first, Abby and I were like, what, is she joking? Um, but she was not. And then we talked to our pastors, and they were like, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You need to go. Because the prophet only makes two, I'm going to call him the president, the president, only makes um, two appearances uh, a year. He makes an appearance in October for the fall conference, and then in April. It's really, really boring. You can look it up on YouTube. It's, it's brutal. He's like, he's, I mean, it really is. And He's like 90-something, nothing against 90-year-olds, I promise. But, like, the only qualification for, um, for, them to ha- for them to be a prophet is that he has to basically be in his 90s and have lived a long life and have a lot of experience, and that qualifies him. And that's how, that's how he qualifies himself at the beginning of, his, um, uh, of the lecture, basically, um, is he talked about all the things he'd done in his life, how many times he'd been married, and how many people he'd lost in his life, and he was a doctor, and and I'm not trying to talk about him like in a rude way, but like that was just how he, that's just how he kind of justified like the position that he was in. Um, anyway, so our pastor said we should go because so this was for a young adults devotional. That's what he was coming in for. They hadn't done a young adults devotional in two years or two or three years because of COVID. So we told Sister Sure that we wanted to go, but it fell on a Sunday. We had no way of getting there. And so um, all, everything is closed on Sundays, all restaurants, I mean, except for like maybe two um, trains, buses. They take the Sabbath seriously. They need to be with their families, eating at home together. Um, and so we told her that we didn't have a way to get there. We didn't, have, we didn't have a car. We were taking the train and stuff. And she was like, oh, I have a friend in Provo who can take you. And so we were like, okay, cool. Like, we'll go with this girl. Reached out to her on Facebook. We were like, this is a little sketchy, but oh, well, it's fine. Reached out to her. Like, you want to take us to go see the prophet? Um, and she picked us up. Abby and I were preparing. We were in the Word. We were praying. We were worshiping because we knew it was actually going to be really, really heavy and hard to sit through. I mean, our pastor said that, like, they don't doubt for a second that, like, the, that, so we know, like, the devil is, like, prowling the earth, and, like, they believe that when the prophet is in Salt Lake City, that, like, the devil is there. Like, it is, it's so heavy. Like, it really is. And so we were preparing our hearts just to be in that, um, just in that scenario, and just among a bunch of lost people. Little did we know, uh, we were expecting to be two-on-one. We were going to, like, you know, like, team up against her. Not really, like, in a bad way, but we were ready and then she shows up in this little Honda CRV with six other people, and we were like, what the heck? There were three girls all returned missionaries and three guys all returned missionaries. And we were like, okay, so we're not talking at all. Um, and so we rode the whole hour to Salt Lake City um, to see the prophet. The highways were packed, like packed with people, all in the Sunday best, so you knew where they were all going. We got there 20 minutes early, and the 21,000, okay, let me rephrase that. The auditorium, the conference center, seats 21,000 people. It had been full for the past three hours when we got there. And all three of the overflow areas were full. So, like, and for us, for Abby and I, we were like, there are roughly 30,000 people here to hear this prophet. Like, wow. And it was just for young adults, just for ages 18 to like 30. And so that was also very alarming. And this was people just waiting outside the temple trying to get in. It literally, like we got there and it still seemed like no one had gotten in because everything was flooded, it was packed. So we ended up watching it 
uh, like the live stream. Um, but it brought some really good conversations. We got to talk to them. Um, so that was a pretty, it was a pretty cool opportunity to go hear the prophet. But the cooler thing is that we got to form relationships with all these random people. Um, so that brings us to Gabe. So we met Gabe um, at the, the um, devotional. And he asked us, he was like, yeah, so are you guys religious at all? And, and sometimes we had to actually ask our, the pastors at Mosaic, like, what do we call ourselves? Like, what, you can't say Christian because they think they're Christians too. I didn't really, I didn't really want to say Baptist because I didn't know if that would be like, I don't want to like sector off like denominations. And so I was like, can I just say evangelical Christian? He was like, of course, like that works. He was like, but I actually encourage you to say Baptist because he said, a lot of Baptists actually come to Utah, and not just Baptists, a lot of people come to Utah. They know that it's a lost state. They, see, they understand Mormonism, and they come, and they do a lot more harm than good because they're not sharing the truth in love. Um, and so he said a lot of people in Utah, because they know they've been there for several years now, they have a really bad connotation associated with, with Baptists. They hear it, and they're like, they, they're shook up about it. So he was like, I want you to call yourself a Baptist so they can see people who can communicate the truth in love, and people who can be their friend, and so we did, call ourselves Baptist. Um, and so Gabe asked, them, we were like, yeah, we're Baptist, and he was like, you know, he said, I grew up in Florida, and I really think I would have been Baptist if I wasn't LDS, and we were like, how does that work? What in the world? And so it was kind of like a little trigger. We were like, we need to keep that in the back, back of our memory so we can come back to that. Um, we ended up, Abby, when we were watching the live stream, she was sitting beside him, and he was like, so how much do you know about the LDS faith? And she's like, well, we've kind of been learning about it. And he was like, so you know about the three kingdoms? Um, she was like, yeah. He said, I don't know if I believe in the three kingdoms. I, I kind of only believe in one. And so for us, and, and I won't go into it, but our pastors walked us through this whole scale of ways to kind of gauge like where they may be on a level of like Mormon to Christian. And we rated him at like a two, a th maybe a three. And like, that's huge. Most people are ones. Um, and so we were like, we've got to pursue this guy. And so we asked him um, the next day, we were like, would you want to hang out sometime? We don't have a car. You have a car? You want to take us around? Um, he goes to BYU. He's our age. And so um, that first picture over there, we went on a six-hour hike with this guy that we didn't know <laughs> um, with no service and cougars. But, but it was literally so fun. And... I know that sounds really bad, but it was really good. Um, it, it looks it looks worse like looking back on it, but it was it was really good. And um, but no, we got to for the first like four to five hours of the hike, we got to um, really just learn about him as a person, just just be his friend. I mean, we didn't know anything about him, so we all shared about our families and you know just hobbies and whatever it is. And we were just praying that. We could somehow talk about what we talked about the day before um, at the temple. And so it ended up, I knew like the Lord was going to bring that conversation naturally, and he did. So we ended up talking about, um, I mean, talked about a ton of stuff. We talked about, he told us, actually, um, he asked us our favorite verse in scripture. And then he told us that he actually liked reading the Bible more than the Book of Mormon because he understood it more. And I was like, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so we talked about, we just talked, I literally had my Bible in my backpack, able to open it up, we're walking down the trail, and like able to just like read scripture, it was really cool. Talked about the differences in our churches, um, for Mormons, it's their ward, they, uh, it's like, their ward is like their congregation, it's geographic, based on where you live, you go to a certain ward, it's actually numbered, it's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, he invited us. We invited him to our church, and he was like, yeah, if you come to my church, I'll come to your church. And we were like, awesome, we'll do that. So we actually got to go to his ward with him and experience. Um, it was a BYU ward, a lot of BYU students. So we got to hear that, experience them, um, and what they learned, which honestly isn't really anything. Not being rude, but they just they don't. They're not being taught or fed at all. And when he came to our service later, he literally said, that's the most Jesus I've gotten in a long time. Because... They, I know it seems like they believe, they do believe vastly different, but they use all the same, the same words. They use, talk about Jesus and God and all these things. So they think they believe the same thing as us. And some of them really don't realize that they don't believe the same. So for him, he was just like a normal comparison. He just thought, you know, different types of churches, same thing. 
Um, and yeah, it was really cool just to get to know him. We went all over together. We, we hiked, we went to the Salt Flats, we went to his church twice, he came to our church twice. We had some incredible gospel center conversations with him. We invited him to dinner with our pastors because since we were only there for a small amount of time, we were going to have to hand him off. We can't sustain that. Also, we as girls can't by any means disciple him. So we had to hand him off to our pastors. Um, keep praying for Gabe. He told us that he didn't really want to, he wasn't really interested in going to Mosaic after we left. Um, but he's asking some really like interesting questions. Like we still keep in touch with him every week, and he just told us that he um, he's coming to South Carolina, which is where we both go to school, um, in a few weeks, and he's staying with our professor and his wife. We are like we asked, and so um, he's going to be staying with two incredibly godly people in their home. He's going to get to meet some of our friends and maybe even go to church with us. So just pray for that. It's just really cool um, how the Lord worked in that. This other girl, Conley, so Conley's awesome. Oh, my goodness. So we met Conley at our favorite Mexican restaurant, Quiero Mas. She is kind of like a server. It's not like a sit down and someone waits on you, but you go to the front, you order your food, and it comes out to you. Um, we, we had gone there two or three times, seen her, didn't really acknowledge her. Um, and then one day we were like, hello, let's look at the people right in front of us. Um, let's try to pursue her. So we just sat at the bar area and started talking to her, and oh my goodness, she was such an open book. She just wanted to talk. She just wanted someone to hear her. And when she found out we were visiting from over here, um, her first question, she was like, oh, so you guys are LDS? Because a lot of people come to Utah. It, it, Utah is literally the holy lands of Mormonism. It's like Israel. It's where they all come. They all want to live there. And she was like, oh, so you're LDS? And we are like, no, we're not. And she said, oh. She said, well, I'm LDS, but I'm not that LDS. And that's... <laughs> But that's where you see the cultural Mormonism. You have all these people who are just born into it. They don't know what they believe. Then you have a lot of the older generations and some of the younger. Some of our friends that we went to see the prophet with are full-fledged. They know their doctrine, and that's scary because they know it, and they're still, like, they're so deceived by it. For her, though, she doesn't know what she believes. She's in the middle. She's kind of looking for something new. So... Yeah, we started, um, we, we probably, we were so tired of Mexican. We went to Kiera Moss like 10 times, like literally two to three times a week um, just to talk to her. And this is her friend Martha. We got to know her too. She's LDS um, and she is from Puerto Rico. Yeah. And so we made rings together. We went to did karaoke and she came to Mosaic Church with us, brought her sister-in-law. Um, it's a really big deal if they come to Mosaic Church with you. Uh, or just come to a different church with you because Mormonism is a very shame-based culture. It, our, our pastors described it as a North American modern-day version of Islam. Um, if they were caught, honestly, and some of them, their families might not care if they're in that cultural Mormonism realm, but, like, they told us, don't invite someone to church unless you know, like, where they kind of are on the scale, where, like, they're willing to count the costs because they can get shunned from their family. She still came, um, which was incredible, and she loved it, and she um, got to talk to our pastors for a while, form a relationship with them, and she's been going since we left. So, and we still keep in touch with her. She loves Dolly Parton, so she says on her bucket list she's going to come to Dollywood. So we want to, uh, we want her to stay with us and bring her to Broadway. So who knows? In the next, like, bit, year, two years, so you should, hopefully you'll see some friends coming in because, and hopefully. Hopefully they're my friends from Utah. Um, so there are literally so many stories I could share, but I just couldn't share all of them. So um, if you're interested in more stories, I'll share all day. But for now, I just want to share a little bit of what God taught me while I was there. Um, so he taught me a lot about gospel fluency. That was the first thing that our pastors really hit hard for us. Um, and it made us feel really um, unequipped, but we were. And the point was... As we're sharing the gospel with these people or talking about things, um, we have to be grounded in Scripture because we can't, if we don't reference Scripture, and maybe we're saying all the right things, but we're not referencing the Bible or we're not opening our Bible and reading the Bible, then they can walk away from our conversation saying, oh, I just disagree with their opinion. But if I open the Word of God, they have a whole new issue. They're, they're disagreeing with the authority of Scripture. They're disagreeing with um, inspired people who wrote his word. And so it's, it's a whole, it's a lot bigger. And, so, and it was really good for us to know what we believe and like how 
um, just to find that in scripture and not just things that we like know, like we've been taught our whole lives, but like where scripture actually supports it. Um, so that was really huge and something that I learned and now can just grow that for the rest of my life. So I praise the Lord and his grace that um, we were taught that at a young age. I'm really thankful for that. Um, I mean, I feel like I knew this, but it really hit hard in Utah. Salvation belongs to our God, not to me. It was not my job, and it is not my job to convert people. Right. It's my job to be faithful and to obey, to share the gospel. Um, but it's going to be a work of him, and maybe through me. He does not need me. Um, and so that was something to constantly be reminding myself. And it brought so much comfort. Like, it really did. When you realize that it has, it doesn't have anything to do with you, like, I mean, obviously I'm going to be trying to represent um, Christ well. That That's for sure. But when you realize it doesn't belong to you, then it takes off a lot of pressure because he is completely in control. Um, I have to lean on the Father for strength. I must in the Word. I kind of talked about that a, a little bit already, but really, really crucial to be in the Word. Um, and community, that was huge. I have taken for granted community. Like, because I had it my whole life, just living, uh, you know, having great friends in high school, or in school in general, growing up in a biblical church, um, going to a school and getting my degree in Christian studies. Like, in Utah, Christians are the minority. The, the time that you spend among other believers, you're spending about three hours among other believers, and that's on a Sunday. That's for Christians, at least. And so for me, I'm spending 99% of my time among other believers. Even if you work in a workplace, that maybe there aren't a lot of believers there, you still are probably doing things with your kids or like you're doing, you have other, you have like devotional groups or you have other things and just friends that like, these people, people that move their life out to Utah, like they're going alone because there's not Christian community there. And we often felt alone, we really did. Abby and I would feel alone a lot of times. Just, um, it, it got kind of tiring at times but it made Sundays literally so sweet to be among other believers. It made it so sweet. Um, and then grace. I feel like God was constantly reminding us his grace at all times, which praise the Lord can always be learning more about his grace. Can't learn enough about it. Um, just, yeah, I, I'll probably cry if I try to talk about that. <laughs> um, so everything I learned from this trip is applicable to everyday life. Just being intentional. Some people ask, like, how did you do it? Like, how did you talk to people and form these relationships and share the gospel? Like, just being intentional, listening, seeing people. And those are things that we often do here. It wasn't anything that Utah offered. And, yes, there is some aspect of Utah that made talking about religion easy because religion is so big there that, like, people will come up to you or they would see that I had, like, two ear piercings and they would be like, oh, or, or you walk out of a coffee shop, which is not allowed. They automatically know you're not LDS. So it's very easy. And when you're not LDS and you're the minority, they want to know why. Why in the world aren't you? Especially for those who um, might see comfort in you because they are full-blown atheists, which is 17%. Um, so anyway, that, this trip has, has prepared me for so much, just, um, just in daily life, but also um, in missions. Um, but I genuinely left Utah knowing God more than I had when I got there. And that is just his grace and that that was my big takeaway. Um, and the last thing I wanted to share is as Abby and I were just so intentional to just be on mission everywhere we were going, and we were just like, we're going, 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 going. A good heart check for us was this question, which is, is the gospel that you're sharing with people transforming your heart and life from the inside out? And that was just a really good heart check for us because we can get a little bit like in the – um, just kind of in the group of things and just going through the motions. And if it really is, then, like, our hearts never stop being broken um, for those who are lost. And we never we never run out of hope, you know. And so there's just a lot of implications of that. But those are some of the things they taught me. And then some ways that you can pray. So I just included some people that we didn't talk about. Again, there were, we probably, um, and this is just, like, I want the God to get all the glory for this, honestly. We are probably able to share the gospel with 10 to 15 people um, like that we had relationships with, from girls at boutiques to um, our the whole group of friends that we went to see the prophet with, 
um, girl at a thrift store. Um, so these are just some of the people that we could talk about. Kate and Morgan, um, they went to see the prophet with us. They are full on LDS. Uh, it's really sad. We got to talk with them a lot and have some really great conversations with them. Um, but they're, they're very deceived. Uh, and Paige as well. That's one of their sisters. And then Quinley, this is really cool. So Quinley, she, um, we met her at a little thrift store, a little pop-up store. And um, we got to, we just went in there a few times, tried to be intentional. She was very quiet. It was very quick to tell us that she was not LDS, not a part of the culture at all. And she saw it for what it was. She was actually hurt by it. You'll see a lot of church hurt, um, especially people coming out of the LDS church. Um, she just didn't like what it represented. And um, we invited her to Mosaic. She was actually, she's from Europe. So she was going back to Europe to visit her family. But she said she was going to be back, but we were going to be gone. Anyway, we invited her. I followed her on social media. I was reaching out to her. Never got a response. Kind of figured it was just kind of like a, you know, she just kind of said yes, but she didn't really, wasn't really going to go. Two months later, last week, I get a text from our pastors. And she came to Mosaic. And so, and like, that just blows my mind. And so she's been coming for a couple, for two weeks now. And so that's really cool. So please be praying for her. I mean, she's searching. And a lot of people out there are searching um, for a true gospel. You can pray for Mosaic Church if you're interested in the work that they're doing or interested in Mosaic or you want to go to Provo. I'll take you. Um, but you can go to their website. Um, it tells a lot about them. Um, they are getting their first cohort of deacons in this fall, and they'll be installed in the spring of 2023. And they need mature believers. So that's something that they've, they're trying to develop from North Greenville. I would love to get it going at Broadway, where we're sending a pipeline of people to Provo, not just for evangelism. Yes, like that is needed. But also, what, you, what, what we're seeing at Mosaic Church is... You've got these young, I mean, everyone's really young, right? So you've got these 20 to 27-year-olds um, that are coming to know the God of the Bible, and they're joining Mosaic, and now our numbers are getting kind of big that, like, our pastors and their wives can't intentionally disciple and pour into every single new member that they have, and they don't have spiritually mature believers to be pouring into um, all the new people that they're getting. And they're not getting, like, a ton, but... As it does incre like grow, they, they just need mature believers um, in the church to disciple others. So pray for that. Um, pray for laborers and pray for harvest as well. And remember, I just put that because I think that's a really big number. Utah County is 99.5% lost. So remember that. And that kind of sums up Utah. But the last thing I did want to include, just so you know a little bit about my next steps, because I'm about to be gone for another year um, from my senior year of school, but a lot of you guys ask, like, what I'm doing next, and I do happen to know a little bit of what I'm doing next. So after I graduate in April, I'm going to be doing the interface program with Ethnos 360 for eight weeks in Papua New Guinea. Um, so I'll be, the intention, the reason I want to do it um, is, well, I'm, I'm still evaluating Ethnos 360 to see if they're someone who I can see myself going through long term, which right now I I do think that that is the case. I'm still praying through that and also just getting experience in rural um, tribal missions. Um, I will get to spend some time with the Housleys while I'm there. I haven't, I've never been. My dad's been a couple times, so it's really exciting. But I, I will be raising support um, this year. I haven't announced it yet. I'll probably do it through Facebook and letters, and I'll probably do some T-shirts or so. But I actually have... I'm not going to get in front of the mics, but I do have some little prayer cards if you're interested. Um, they have my, my name picture on them, and it's a reminder to pray daily for me as I prepare for that, but also when I do go next summer. I know it's really far away, but you're probably not going to see me for a while, so I want to get it out there. But it also has different ways that you can give. Um, I have a page on the Ethnos 360 page under missionaries. You can give that way or um, honestly, you can pray. Like, that is the most you can do. Um, so don't feel like you have to give financially either. So those are just for me some of my next steps, and that's basically it. So, yeah. Okay.
Well, thank you, Carly. Um, uh, pray for Tony. The uh, apparently the eye doctor is holding him hostage this evening. I think he went in around three something, and he had not seen the doctor by uh, the start of service. So. Uh, I want to go quickly over our prayer needs, but I, I do want to thank Carly, first of all, and uh, just the, the wonderful information about the LDS Church and the Mormons, what they believe. Um, definitely be praying for her and her next steps, and I love the reminder to be intentional. Uh, I mean, each and every one of us has a mission field right outside these doors. If, the, if we would just take that minute to think, hey, is this person I talked to every single day is lost and on their way to hell and and if i could just engage them in conversation with the gospel and if you you'd be surprised if you start praying lord give me more opportunities to share the gospel how many opportunities will come your way so thank you carly for that reminder um i just um a few things i'll just reiterate so the the text that were sent out today as far as prayer requests the um family of uh, David Walker, JB's brother, that passed away. Uh, Hank Brown is having heart tests this week. Marilyn Crow is seeing a, a specialist on Friday. And uh, and then we're, we're collecting disaster relief supplies for uh, the, the flooding in Kentucky. Um, and uh, it says you can donate those items in the trailer in front of the church. Uh, does anybody have any other needs that the church needs to be aware of? Donnie, Donnie. Oh, on the sheet? I don't know. Donnie? On the text? I'm not sure. Anybody know? <laughs> Chuck wants to know who, who Donnie is. We need to pray for <laughs> there, there's a Donnie out there somewhere that needs prayer, so pray for Donnie. Um, does anybody else have any needs that we need to share with the body? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for another evening again to just uh, come before you. We, uh, we, we know that you know every name on this sheet and every, um, everything that we're all going through in and outside uh, of this body here, Lord. We just pray your will be done work in uh, the circumstances, those that are sick, those that are having procedures and tests, and I just pray that uh, you would sustain them through those, pray that the, they would all look to you and trust you as you lead them through uh, whatever they may be walking through today. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for Carly and uh, her ministry in Utah, and just uh, be with her, lead her as she uh, prays about her next steps. And uh, be with us as we go out into our mission fields this week and try to be con intentional. Uh, give us those opportunities to share your word, to see those come to faith in you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all are dismissed. <laughs>